best answers to awkward questions. With Lucy Marskell, sponsored by Urban Saints. Hello, how are you doing? I hope you're having a good Sunday night. I'm Lucy and I'll be with you till 7pm for Awkward, the show that gives honest answers to awkward questions. So let me start off by asking you the first question of the night. Uh, it's this. What does an Australian man, a Muslim from Birmingham and a radio show presented by a Chinese lady have in common? The answer, tonight's show, of course. Yes, that's right. Uh, tonight, I have the wonderful, special, awesome Tim Forsett all the way from Birmingham. He is the CEO of The Feast, a Christian charity um, that seeks to promote community between Christian and Muslim young people. That's right. The Feast is a great charity um, looking at how we can promote more um, bridges and more understanding. So, Tim, welcome to the studio. Hello, Lucy. Great Hello. to be here. Nice to have you too. It's great to have everybody here who's listening as well. Shout out to everyone's listening. Tweet me at Premier Gospel. Let me know where you are. So, Tim, tell me more about how the feast got started and how you got involved. The feast started a couple of years ago. Uh, it was founded in 2009 in Birmingham. Uh, it had come out of about 10 years' worth of work uh, from the Scripture Union youth worker in Birmingham called Dr. Andrew Smith or affectionately known as SME. Um, he had been exploring ways to help Christians engage with people of other faiths and he arrived at some techniques that we now use at the feast. It started with one youth worker and we now have eight staff across the country. That sounds brilliant. So tell me more about your involvement. So how long have you been at the feast for yourself? I'm not a Brummie, as you can probably tell from my accent. No way. I'm, I don't have the accent of someone from the Midlands. Uh, I come from Australia. I spent 10 years working for Scripture Union in Queensland, in Brisbane. So um, I did inform them that I'd be online tonight on, on radio and asked if anyone would be up in, in the early hours of the morning to listen. But um, no, I spent 10 years supporting Christian youth and children's work uh, in uh, my home state and uh, through a whole range of funny connections I've ended up now working with uh, the Feast in Birmingham. That's brilliant. Well, thank you so much for coming all the way from Australia to talk with us today. Well, um, Tim, I want to ask you so many questions tonight. Um, with the feast then, I was looking on your website, just looking um, actually at the Youth Work magazine article um, that you wrote um, back in July 2013, was it? Yep, yes, last, year ago. last summer. So shout out to Youth Work magazine as well. Follow them at Youth Work Mag on Twitter. Um, Tim wrote an article called Faith to Faith, uh, talking about how we can break down uh, the walls that maybe we purpose Christians against um, other people of different religions, especially Muslims. So, Tim, tell me more about the article that you wrote last uh, year. Well, we were invited by Youth Work magazine to help people to understand that uh, there's different ways that we can uh, hold our integrity as Christians and still connect with people of other faiths. So um, that's what the feast exists to do. A lot of engagement with other faiths has either been purely evangelistic, which is often... Uh, led to an argument or has led to uh, a broken friendship so that if someone says they're not interested in becoming a Christian, it's broken. Or, or it's led to a, a washing away of the distinctives of our Christian faith and just all about friendship, essentially an all roads lead to heaven type approach that some people have have, um, have taken. And the feast is trying to, to get... Uh, more Christians into a space that, that uh, empowers them and encourages them to love and share their faith with respect to people who have other faiths. And in our case, the majority of our work is with Muslims. So we were invited to get people thinking, and so the purpose of that article was to do that. Um, and I'm grateful that even a year on, there's people reading it like yourself, and hopefully people might go back. It's on our website, so people can go on their website or the Youth Week magazine to read it. Definitely. If you are online right now or listening to London DAB Radio or you're on your smartphone app listening to the show and you just want to look at what is the feast, what is this charity that Lucy and Tim are talking about, uh, check out thefeast.org.uk. Um, that's all one word. And you guys are on Twitter and Facebook, right? We are. The, the Feast Project, we're called. Great. So follow at the Feast Project. I'm sure they'll be happy to hear all about um, your views too. So Tim, um, with uh, the activities you guys do with the young people, um, what kind of events have you had? Because like you said, it's a lot about um, intentional, practical, um, yeah, community. The way the feast looks, it, it, it is all about lots of little gatherings of people of different faiths. So um, in the last couple of weeks, we will have done uh, events around poetry, around um, scavenger hunts, photography, litter picking. Um, uh, they did an, a, a social action event where they launched 
the sponsorship of a, uh, a young person in Mali. Um, they wanted to learn about um, partnership and togetherness here and raise funds to see people helped overseas. So it's, it's as simple as normal youth work, um, but embedded into everything that we do uh, is conversations. And an example is this coming weekend, we have 10 young lads going away for a weekend residential, and it'll look like any residential that would include a dozen teenage boys. There's going to be ropes courses and archery and uh, lots of mud, no doubt, and the, and the good amount of, um, of boisterous uh, fun. But the boys are going to be talking about giving over the weekend. And so you're going to have five Muslim boys with five Christian boys thinking about giving from their faith perspective and how their faith empowers them to give time, money, efforts, their skills to people who are in need both in their family, in their community, in their school or in the world. And so we're, we're using uh, a fun weekend to talk about uh, giving and get these boys to learn skills to talk about each other, to, to each other about their faith. Brilliant. That sounds such a fun weekend. I want to go. <laughs> that sounds really fun, Tim. And um, we know these um, events that you do, um, how often do they take place? Do you have stuff every week or is it um, you know, every month? It varies, but we would have in Birmingham, we would have about 40 of these different encounter experiences a year. Um, some of them are a Saturday afternoon scavenger hunt in the park. The new big thing is geocaching. That's what we're getting our young people into. Have you heard of geocaching? I love geocaching. You know what? I did that. Um, well, last time I did that wasn't that long ago, but I loved it. It's fun. Well, please divulge to uh, the listeners who maybe don't know what the amazing thing that geocaching well, is. Well, geocaching is a bit of a mystery. There are thousands of people out there who hide things uh, in parks and gardens and um, all over the place, and they they let that hidden geocache, that little item, be registered on a website, and the ge the coordinates go online, and you have to find it. And so sometimes they're just hanging in a tree, sometimes they're buried under stones or in caves or up, log, up logs and trees. Uh, and so what we're going to be doing is taking some young people into uh, an environment where there are these hidden things. They're going to be doing a normal scavenger hunt using mobile phone apps and compasses and and whatever. Uh, ways we can use to find these hidden items and they're going to be talking about searching so the topic of discussion will be when does your faith um, prompt you to search when is it hard to search what happens when you find the thing you're looking for and so we're going to getting young people to talk honestly about how their faith guides them in the search for truth meaning purpose and hopefully eternity and salvation that's brilliant. It's like a, a deep search for geocaches, <laughs> but also, like you said, the meaning of life and our relationship to God. So, Tim, um, I think it's really great what you guys are doing, but I know that maybe a lot of people listening would also have a lot of questions for you, such as um, the one that you brought up before, which was um, about how interfaith dialogue, um, like what the intention is. So I know you wrote in the article, Youth Foot Magazine, that you say it's not necessarily about ooh, evangelism, the missionary agenda. Um, so how would you um, address maybe people who are criticizing saying actually you know what you're just watering down the Christian faith well th this is why it's lovely to sit down over a, a cuppa this afternoon and over share with feast. with you and our audience um, this is the challenging question that exists in, in a number of mission settings in the world and, and engagement with people of other faiths is one of those um, in as much as in that article I did say that it what the feast creates is not an evangelism space um, in as that may be true, and that is true about the feasts' environments, but everything Christians do witnesses to who Jesus is and what Jesus is in their lives. So in, a, in, in all reality, whether I am buying my milk at the local grocery store or whether I find a homeless person who's on the street asking for money or I'm speaking to my, my civil engineering friend, um, I can be and should be sharing the love of Jesus in acts and in deeds in everything that I do. So when we create these environments that young people come onto with the feast, what we are saying when it's not an evangelism space or when it's not a, a mission environment is that we don't want people to come there ready with their four spiritual laws or ready to get the gospel across to someone and look for them to respond. We want the young people's faith to radiate out of them. That's, that's encouraged and should be what um, the feast empowers young people to do. But we also give the permission for the kids of other faiths to share the best of their religion. So that means that these young people are meeting together, looking across a cup of uh, a pizza and a, and a can of Coke after having just been scavenger hunting in the neighbourhood um, and starting to realise 
what are the best things about my faith and how can I share these with some people who are from another community, another faith, another culture who will share the best of their faith. And it means that we're creating an environment that's respectful and friendship building, but in the midst of it all is people sharing faith. Now, some would say that that's not evangelism because we're not getting to the point of response. You're not going to say at the end of the event, okay, who wants to become a Christian? Because <laughs> that's the technical definition of evangelism and, and evangelism seeks an outcome, which is people praying a prayer or yes. saying to come to youth group. But there is a huge amount that is gained through these safe non-evangelism spaces where kids are sharing their faith and so sharing the seeds of who Jesus is in their lives with people who are from other faiths and cultures. So um, we do fiercely defend the non-evangelism of our spaces because we don't want the Muslim, Sikh or Hindu who comes to an event to try to change our teenagers. So as a Christian, I don't want Christian kids to feel unsafe in an environment where there'll be kids of another faith, possibly with their leaders and parents uh, on around the outside of the event. So I don't want to treat the same. I don't want to, to do to do what I. I don't want to do what I would like done to my daughter. You love your neighbour as yourself. Right? Yes, yes. So we're treating the kids who come to our event as we would want to be treated if our children were in their other faith environment. That makes that that's that makes sense actually. I think that's quite an interesting view. Um, I'd love to hear um, what you think um, if you're listening. Whether you're listening uh, in Birmingham, your Manchester, London, around the world, tweet me at Premier Gospel. Let me know what is it that um, makes you feel awkward um, when you're around maybe people of other faiths. Maybe you've got friends or family. Uh, maybe you're married or going out with someone with a different faith. Is there any kind of awkward tension there? Um, chatting about maybe Jesus or chatting about who God is. Um, um, that yeah, you'd like to um, yeah let Tim and I know about because it'd be great to give you a Sunday shout out. If you've got any questions as well to Tim, uh, please uh, get in contact. Here is how you can do it. Call 020-7316-0101. Text Gospel to double six triple seven or tweet at Premier Gospel. That's right. That's how you can get in touch with me tonight. This is Awkward, the show that gives honest answers to awkward questions. Now, Tim Fawcett from Birmingham-based charity The Feast is here with me today. We've been chatting about how we can build bridges between Christian and Muslim young people and the importance of that. So, Tim, um, we were chatting before uh, the break in a few songs that sometimes, as Christians, we maybe find it hard to chat to people of different faiths, whether, you know, we've got um, friends and family, different faiths, or maybe we have none. So why do you think that is? I think um, it's not uncommon it's actually quite natural that we live amongst people that are similar to us so this is um, whether we're in a big city we, we would gravitate towards people who speak the same language we'd eat similar foods if our culture means that we spend a lot more time together in a cultural group uh, I've got Caribbean friends and they spend a lot of time together the extended family spend a lot of time together whereas Western families maybe of a, a English heritage or an Australian heritage don't tend to do that um, so I think there is a natural healthy reasons why our communities spend time together. There is, of course, the faith a reason that goes with that. If you're a Muslim community, they worship together, they pray together a lot more. They go to madrasa, which is a, a mos mosque school, so that means they live close together, they spend time together. So I think it's not... We shouldn't feel bad in, a, in the sense that I live in a white village or I, my community is surrounded by people um, of, that listen to the same hip-hop music as me or whatever it might be. But the scary thing is, is when we... Um, we don't have any sort of ability to or desire to connect in healthy ways with those people who are different. We we might read a newspaper and we read about um, this group and we, we assume all these things about them because we've read about them in the newspaper. Or we hear a sermon at church that talks about a particular group of people and you know, that's where we get our information. Um, but how do we get to meet them ourselves? How do we show friendship with them if we bump into them in the street or in our workplace? So one of the things the Feast is trying to do is equip people to know what to say when you meet someone of another faith and to, to be able to form a friendship based on trust and respect. Absolutely. Well, thank you for sharing um, a bit about that, why we find it really hard um, sometimes Christians to chat to people of different faiths. So moving on to um, the actual work of the feast then, um, I know you've set up um, another, um, well, another uh, feast, actually, how can we call it, in Tower Hamlets in London. Is that right? Yes, there's um, a new employee who started with the feast in late uh, February. Shout out. <laughs> uh, his name is Demiser. Uh, he's based in Tower Hamlets. Uh, and so I'm sure he would love to have 
uh, people get in touch with him to shout him a coffee or he'll shout you a coffee to talk about what he's planning to do and uh, he'll, he'll be looking to expand the work around the team they you talked about residentials they ran a girls residential last year so another they're fundraising at the moment to run another girls residential with Christian Muslim girls um, coming out of East London so um, shout out to them they're looking to do that a weekend or two ago, our team in Bradford also did a residential with boys. Uh, and so last May, Chris started uh, between the two towns of Bradford and Keithley. So, um, yeah, they're, the work's growing outside Birmingham, which is very exciting. Wow, shout out to Yorkshire as well. Um, so with stories then, I'd love to hear some stories of, you know, the work that God is doing through it. So, yeah, feel free to share a story. Well, I, I think um, it is easy to easier to explain the work when you hear about it actually happening. But... Uh, the, an example of um, the, some of the benefits of when you connect, we've got two communities in Birmingham. One is uh, largely Asian, quite poor, inner city. Uh, it's an area that uh, police and authorities have often painted with a, a, an extremism or a, or a terrorism brush. So it's, it's had the police in its community looking for... Um, the the small number of people that are troublemakers so that's the sort of sort of shroud over that community and then we got to know a church in another community which is all white working class white and the day I met with the youth pastor of, of the church that we were going to work with he said he just had a visit from the counter-terrorism police who were worried about white extremism and so they were trying to find out how the BNP, EDL, different parties like that in the community were stirring up negativity towards people of other faiths, particularly Muslims and immigrants and with a very strong far-right agenda. So here I had young people from a Asian community and young people from a white uh, and, and some Christian young people from a white community who both had um, a, a problem in their community around extremism. So what we did was an exchange event over two Saturday afternoons. Um, on the first occasion, the young people from the Muslim community came over to visit uh, the young people from the Christian community, uh, the, the church, and they did what was called an exchange event. They came over and the Christian young people showed them where they went to church, where they lived, where they went to the local shops. They did a picture hunt. It was all like around the scavenger hunt theme again. Um, and in the midst of that, they talked about what it meant to be Christians that lived in that community. And then on the on a follow-up weekend, a few, couple of weekends later, the, the Muslim young people um, came, the Christian young people came over to the Muslim community and they walked the streets and they, they'd learnt to, to to see where they shopped, where they lived, where they went to their mosque. And so over these two weekends, these young people connected from their two communities. Now what we know is that um, the young people that we worked with then went back and spoke to their communities. And we know that in the church, the young people got up and spoke to their church, 40, 50 adults, and said, we thought we were going to meet some Muslims, but we met friends, we made friends. And as a consequence of their simple revelation that by getting to know some young people personally and on a very honest level about sharing the, the best things about their faith, um, a lady in the church went and said hello to a Muslim um, volunteer in an aged care home as a result of that. So here some young people demonstrated that I didn't need to be afraid of someone who was different. She told They told their church and their church went and said, we can join on this journey as well. We, we can actually break the ice. I meet a Muslim. I don't need to be afraid of her. I can say hello and say my name and, and treat her as a human, which is what Jesus taught us to do, is to love our neighbor. And if our neighbor happens to be a Muslim, we have to work at how we love them. Wow, what a melting pot of stories you've got there. Wow, there's so many different people involved, like you said, like I'd have the to white say extremism that... and, you know, that's something I'd never thought of, actually. Well, I would say that we don't, that's a that's a, an extreme example in a way because most of the young people have no problems and don't even know and aren't in communities where there's extremism issues. But that's a quite a, a big example where the divide was quite broad, yes. um, potentially. But because they're teenagers, 13, 14, 15 year olds that that aren't particularly complicated. <laughs> um, they enjoy a bit of fun. They enjoy food, which is what we call the feast. Um, and they came together, had a lot of fun. And it, it led to change from the people around them. Absolutely. So would you be able to tell me, honestly, because I was thinking with all the great stuff you do, there's always going to be um, maybe some conflict. So as we said before, um, there might be some Christians who say, um, you're just, you know, watering down your faith. And actually, you know, Jesus is the only way to heaven. So you're actually creating a way of not you know having that conversation so but you obviously you'd say actually we're creating a conversation to understand each other more um what about um maybe conflict so you talk about extremism so a lot of people in the media um talk about muslim extremism um politics etc um would you be able to tell me more about your involvement with um, promoting positivity and um, that comes from the news yeah we um 
I'm very glad to say that amongst the teenagers that we work with, the young people, we have seen no conflict that we have had Christians and Muslims and Sikhs and some Hindus in a room together um, having very honest conversations, but we haven't seen fights, conflicts, arguments among them. But I'm from Birmingham. Uh, we've recently had a very high-profile story that's been sweeping our schools around an, accus an accusation that's been made that Muslims are taking over government schools. Now, it's a school governance issue. It's not an extremism or counter-terrorism um, issue, even though it's being painted as such. Uh, it's essentially um, agendas and politics going on around schools, but because of fairly... Um, uh, the way that way it's been handled, uh, it's blown up to be a much bigger story, and it's it's sort of raised up all these tensions and preconceptions and agendas that people have. But the reason we were grieved by it was there were mu Muslims in the midst of this that were being um, accused of being extreme, but they were just passionate parents caring for their kids. They were innocents. They were just um, trying to exercise their faith. They were trying to be respectful to the country they live in. They were not wanting to cause any hurt to minorities that were around them. They just wanted to care and give their kids a good education that had a f faith framework. And so what we found, there were lots of innocents being affected by it. And the feast uh, in, in empowered our young people to have a voice. We wanted to say the community cohesion is strong in the city of Birmingham and in many other parts of the country and that when the media or when one story comes up, it doesn't get blown up to damage the relationships that are there. So we got young people who uh, got helium balloons, they wrote positive messages on those helium balloons, and they handed them to each other and to other children in a local park to say, um, this is a city with people of different faiths and cultures, but we can get on. Now, I'm excited to be a Christian and to be a part of a charity that is instigating a love your neighbour even if your neighbour is different to me agenda. That seems very kingdom-like. It seems the sort of thing that Jesus would do to defend minorities, to defend uh, people, even if some of them have done something wrong. And there might have been some Muslim activists in their community that are doing something wrong. I, I, I can't comment on whether the accusations will come out to be true or not. But we wanted to stand against prejudice. We wanted to stand against hate. We wanted to stand against people's negativity and say that as a Christian, I am motivated to love my neighbour. And if my neighbour is Muslim, Sikh or Hindu, I'm still going to love them. And there's so many of them are um, neutrals in this. They need to be protected. Wow. Ooh, what a story. Now, if you want to talk about something that's awkward, that's an awkward story. Guys, if you just tuned in, I'm talking to Tim Fawcett um, from The Feast, a Birmingham-based charity that seek to bring a, you know, community and unity between Christian and Muslim young people through various um, events and um, activities. And um, we've just been talking about what the news call. Um, is it the Trojan horse? That was the, that's the story in Birmingham, yeah. Yes, Trojan but horse. you've called it differently with your balloon. We balloon, called it you Trojan Hope. Yes. Trojan Hope. So take that on Twitter. Hashtag Trojan Hope. <laughs> Honest answers to awkward questions. With Lucy Marskell, sponsored by Urban Saints. Welcome back to Premier Gospel Music for Life. This is Awkward, the show that gives honest answers to awkward questions. And today's show is no exception. We have an Australian man who works with Muslims in Birmingham and a Chinese lady, aka yours truly, talking about the awkward issue of how Christian young people and Muslim young people can work together. So, Tim, um, we've talked about your stories, um, the activities that you guys do, like deer catching, which is pretty cool, and um, also uh, maybe the negative um, things in the press as well about white extremism, Muslim extremism. How can we, um, you know, um, embrace that, really? How can we, um, yeah, how can we overcome uh, the prejudice that people have? So how is working with, you know, a variety of faiths, so, like, you know, Muslims as well as Hindus, do seeks um, everybody else um, change your view of God I think that's one of the best parts about this work um, and one of the things that we advocate for churches to get involved with it is its discipleship benefits to uh, Christian teenagers um, there's um, a very fundamental teaching that Jesus had that we should love our neighbor now when I moved into my street in Birmingham my neighbors on both sides were Muslims and so I had to physically and theologically interpret that passage in a way that that meant I stayed good neighbors with them <laughs> uh, if I had um, just tried um, to uh, ignore them then that wouldn't have been loving if I had tried to uh, send tracks through their door if I'd done what is really really basic old-school evangelism then I wouldn't have had an ongoing friendship 
But the day we arrived in our street, my next door neighbour's name is Rosie, Rosie Hussain, she um, came out to welcome us as we arrived and her, her husband, her extended family, her own children have been incredibly friendly with our family and I learnt what it meant to be treated really well by neighbours as I arrived in their street. And then when I started unpacking Jesus' teaching um, about loving neighbours, um, people asked him to help them understand what it meant to apply loving your neighbour and he told them the story of the Good Samaritan. Um, and in the story he gave the credit of and the, the, the role modelling of good loving your neighbourness to a Samaritan, someone who was a despised member of society who Israelis would not have wanted to associate with. And I, it struck me that to get the impact of that story, it's like me learning to love my neighbour from my good Muslim neighbours. Um, and so now often to try and get people to understand Jesus' teaching about that, we now talk about the parable of the good Muslim, that the Muslim is the one who models the care for the broken person on the street. Wow, that's and, quite controversial. I quite like it. Mm, so our, our um, journey with our Muslim Sikh Hindu neighbours has come through meeting them, loving them and being treated so well by them. Um, the other passage that we, uh, many other passages we've had to grapple with is um, uh, in First Peter 3, Jesus said to always be ready to share the reason for the hope you have um, with gentleness and respect. Now the wonder with people of other faiths is that their faith is a big part of their identity and so talking about faith is really normal and natural. Unlike uh, a lot of people from Western backgrounds where faith is now irrelevant, yes. um, people of other faiths quite enjoy talking about faith. And if shown the right way to do it, faith conversations can be healthy and constructive and actually be a good environment for um, uh, engaging really well, a good trigger for a good engagement. So I've had to really understand when Jesus said, be ready to share your faith in, in context where there's people of other faiths, being ready to share your faith is actually quite an exciting part of um, loving your neighbour and being amongst those people. So I think I have, my faith has grown enormously. I've had to reread passages of scripture and try and understand um, them in a context that was not as safe as my little Australian church bubble. Um, but these communities, um, I've grown a lot and I've seen God in, in a, a range of different ways that really pushes me and challenges the prejudices that I have. What about um, the guidelines that you have? Because I, I was looking at your website, check out uh, The Feast uh, Project on Twitter, and you can also look at the official website, The Feast Project, no, thefeast.org.uk. Yep, right? that's, that's the website. Right. And you're on Facebook too. Um, so I look on the website and also on the Youth Work um, article that you did last uh, July, and you talked about um, some guidelines, some tips for Christians um, and also Muslims um, with, you know, talking about faith. Because like you said, I find it so interesting why um, Muslims or other people don't face it find it so natural but like you said in our western society it's a bit awkward going oh by the way guys i believe in god you know i believe in jesus so what are some guidelines well these guidelines are our secret source so lucy i'm i'm afraid oh, secret. We're, yeah we're giving them away uh, so this is if people were to to copy and use our guidelines they would not need the feast because this is the the reason that makes our work unique and what makes it work oh no um, hot off the press guys it is true but we would like every person listening uh, who checks out our website to put these into practice. Basically we have 10 tips for how a relationship or how a, an environment of discussion um, can function with people who are of different faiths. And so these include simple things like listening to, every, what, listening to what everyone has to say or being honest about what we say, um, but through to some more challenging ones like speaking positively of my own faith rather than negatively about other people's. That is so easy to do that often when we get into a conversation we'll pick the problems out that we know of in the other person's faith and say, whether if let's say a, 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 a person who has no faith, we might say um, you have a, a problem in your life because you've got sin. So we're talking about their mm. life yeah. and their need for Jesus. But what the feast wants more people to do is is think about and share passionately the things that are the best about our faith. So Positively affirm your faith rather than put someone else down. Exactly. So exactly. would you say, so if, let's say for example, um, I'm with a youth group and I have a Christian young person who's like, oh, I've got this Muslim friend at school, I'm going to go share Jesus with them and just go give them straight. So you would say don't um, put down Muhammad or the Quran yeah. um, or Allah or the Hadith. You yep. would say talk positively about Jesus yeah. who is he is to you. It, it, and that's actually harder. <laughs> it is, it's right? It's actually harder for a young teenage person who knows that 
what the cross is about, who Jesus is, what salvation is, that if the people don't have salvation, then they, they're going to go to hell. That's, that's the sort of stuff that is easy textbook Christianity answers. But for a young person to think, why, what is the best thing about being a follower of Jesus? What has Jesus really done in my life? What is Jesus doing in my life now? What has that done to change the challenges I might face? Might be economic challenges or employment or bullying from my peers in school or whatever it might how is Jesus living out real and actively in those everyday situations and share those share the things that you've read in your Bible that day whatever it might be okay well thank you very much that's the first guideline we're going to talk maybe about one more guideline we don't want to give the whole secret source away like you said <laughs> about the feast um, after a few songs I'm going to play you um, Luke Fiasco who's actually a Muslim rapper himself um, superstar and then I've got some Toby Mac some Kurt Franklin coming up and some Switchfoot so stay tuned let me know also um, your experience of uh, maybe chatting with people of the faiths whether you find it really scary whether you find it awkward whether you find it you know really natural really fun um, let me know also what is um, a good way um, to chat to people who maybe don't understand more about Jesus. Let me know. Tweet me at Premier Gospel if you want a Sunday shout out. And if you're a Muslim listening, let me know what's the best thing about being a Muslim. You can drop a comment on facebook.com slash Premier Gospel. Text me. Um, you can text me Gospel, first word, plus your message to double six triple seven. That's double six triple seven. Okay, we'll be right back after this. <laughs> by Urban Saints. Change in the future, one life at a time. Hello, welcome back to Premier Gospel Music for Life. We're having a great show tonight, talking about interfaith dialogue. What is it um, that makes um, you know interfaith dialogue so awkward? I've got Tim Forsett from the Feast Charity, all the way from Birmingham in the studio. I've just put um, a question on Premier Gospel Facebook page. Uh, check out facebookcom Gospel to join in the discussion. I've put up a picture and I said, "Do you find it awkward chatting with other people of different faiths?" Let me know your experience and thoughts and I'll give you a Sunday shout out so check that out for more um, I've got a tweet from Amos um, in Kim from Kampala Uganda who says um, he's really enjoying the music but also he says um, it's interesting having interfaith dialogue but I think you need to have boundaries as well Tim what do you think definitely agree and thank you Amos for sharing um, that point that's the whole reason we have our guidelines for dialogue is because we want to give people the scope to work in the permission to say certain things and encouragement not to say other things so yes boundaries are important Absolutely. So would you be able to give one other guideline? Because before the music, we had um, another guideline of just being able to listen to each other and to affirm our faith rather than put the other one down. Yep. Uh, a second one might be not treating, pe not treating people here as a spokesperson for their faith. We are very good at meeting one Muslim and thinking that they speak for all Muslims, meeting one Hindu and think that they speak for all Hinduism. Um, no, we want to treat that person as an individual, as yes. someone who has their own personal story, they, some of the things that they would say other people of their faith and community would disagree with. So we want to encourage you to treat each person you meet as an individual and not someone who represents the whole group. Wow, I think that's some wise advice there. Guys, let me know what you think. What are your top tips maybe for chatting people of different faiths? Or maybe you've got some stories of where it's maybe gone wrong or gone right. Let me know. Tweet me at Premier Gospel. I give you a shout out. So, Tim, um, we've got so many things we could talk about. Um, would you be able to tell me more about the youth work, uh, well, not youth work, sorry, the awards um, for actually young people that you've yes, got? Yes, we are very excited. We've been playing with this idea and have had very ver various versions of it but thanks to some support from Birmingham City Council and a shout out to them um, we are able to hold in the Birmingham Council House Banqueting Suites um, our Youth Awards on the 11th of June and we are going to be recognising and celebrating the initiatives of young people from across Birmingham and particularly focused on the schools and the areas that we're working but want to show that they are being young leaders in their schools, in their communities. Um, they are demonstrating good neighbourliness. They are getting involved in social action. They are being role models for their community or even their faith group. And we want to be able to highlight them and, and celebrate them. So, um, yeah, we'd love um, to... Uh, I don't know how many young people in Birmingham are listening, but some can nominate. Um, and we're very excited about that being a real highlight event for our, our June. Brilliant. And um, what day is that this June? It's Wednesday night, the 11th of June, I believe. It's just... Um, coming up in far too short amount of time. Wow, that's not long at all. No. Well, I hope it goes really well. Thank you. So, um, with that, um, you've also had the is it the right the Bishop of Birmingham is now a patron. Yeah, least. well, how did that how how did that happen? We we've had some pretty exciting connections. Um, we have. 
the Bishop of Birmingham has come on board as our pat- patron when uh, his predecessor, the, the former Christian chaplain that we had, was the Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams. So we've had some fairly big uh, Church of England endorsement uh, for it, and we enjoy the work with a number of key dioceses in Bradford and East London. Um, but we're very, very grateful for Bishop David um, being our, our local patron, and he's been very active in introducing us in key networks and promoting our message in, in the circles that he mixes in. Our Muslim patron is Professor Mona Siddiqui, who's currently of uh, Edinburgh University, and we've, uh, we're seeking a new patron uh, of each of those two faiths at the moment, so hopefully to be able to announce something in the autumn. Definitely. Well, if you are a Rev or you are a pastor who, I don't know what you'll be doing on a Sunday besides church, but anyway, if you are listening <laughs> in or a youth worker, you maybe know someone, um, be interested in that, then get in touch with The Feast. Uh, it's thefeast.org.uk. That's right. Yes. Well, um, I've also um, got some um, great uh, yeah, great music coming up, so stay tuned. I've got some Switch of it, got some Fred Hammond as well, so stay tuned for that. But in the meantime, Tim, um, I've also want to talk to you about um, your overseas work as well because the feast doesn't just you know operate in Birmingham and in London and Yorkshire but you also do um, trips don't you tell me more about that well uh, we've joked about our secret source being these guidelines for dialogue but honestly we want to share them we feel that God's given us a hint as to how his kingdom can operate and how we should connect and love our neighbours of different faiths, and we do want to share it. So when we've fielded inquiries from around the country, um, we've tried to support them, encourage them, invite them to training events, and empower them to do their own events. Um, But we got an inquiry from some Christians in Lebanon, in Beirut, a couple of years ago through um, our chair of trustees, Andrew Smith, um, and that led to two exchanges in the autumns, uh, in the summers of 2011 and 2012, and that has continued continued to grow. We, we took young people from the UK and we met with young people from uh, Beirut. They met in Istanbul, somewhere they were both new to. We had Christians and Muslims from a whole range of faith backgrounds. So we had Protestant Catholics and and wow. non-traditional church Christians. We had Shia and Sunni Muslims and Palestinians. It was a real mix. At the end of the week, they were grappling with politics and identity and some of the most complicated political geopolitical issues and here we were 20 young people from Birmingham and Lebanon doing that but there's it's led to now having pilot events um, modeled on our work under the the label of the feast operating in Beirut um, which is very very exciting so two they've run and they're planning to run more we're in discussions with a number of other countries including around the Middle East and even in Europe and I'd love to take this sort of work back to my home country of Australia so uh, we certainly hope that more people get empowered and encouraged to be able to connect, to create these safe spaces where young people can talk together. Um, And if the feast can be of support, then please let us know. Definitely. Well, shout out to anyone in Australia who's listening because, you know, it's like 4 or 5 a.m. in the morning. (laughs) Um, But anyway, um, you can listen back to this episode. Um, If you have missed half of it, you've just tuned in. Um, Just go to premiergospel.org.uk slash awkward. All the episodes are on there too. I'm going to play a song, um, but I know, Tim, you have to shoot off soon. Is that right? So, so. Well, I'm going to play one song and then we'll come back and wrap up if that's okay. So if you've got any questions for Tim before he shoots off, not back to Australia, back to Birmingham, um, home of the feast, tweet me at Premier Gospel, go on facebook.com slash Premier Gospel and leave me a comment. Here we go. (laughs) Awkward is here with you till seven, but my special guest Tim Fawcett has to shoot off because he's going back to Birmingham um, where the feast charity that exists to work with young Muslims and Christians in dialogue um, is based. So Tim, some finishing thoughts. Uh, It's been a real honour to be able to meet you, Lucy, and to be able to share with your audience. And I do want to commend uh, them to this awkward topic of learning to love neighbours of other faiths um, and uh, be Jesus for them. But I think uh, when you were asking me to to think about something to close with, I've I've been really encouraged by um, a a verse in in 1 Corinthians 8, um, chapter 8, when... uh, Paul was trying to encourage the church to grapple with this issue of food offered to idols. He, he threw a line in there saying, knowledge puffs up, 
but love builds up. Yeah. And so often we can worry about the truth. We can worry about who's right, who's wrong, needing to promote our truth, correct people who aren't right. Um, and even sometimes we, we're so paralyzed by the lack of knowing what's true, what's right, am I going to do the wrong thing, that um, we forget to love. And I want to encourage people to look into the eyes of a person that may be of another faith, whether they're wearing a turban, they might be wearing a full face veil, but look into their eyes and love them and to meet their needs. If they have needs, help them across the street. If they are lonely, if they are being persecuted, then do something to defend them because that's what a loving person would do. And in the midst of that, share that you love Jesus um, and let them know that there's Jesus in your life and he motivates you to do things like being nice to other people um, and give God the glory through the deeds, not just the words that we often share. So I, I, I really think that the Muslim community and my Sikh and Hindu friends are amazing people and I'm excited to know that, that um, uh, they have enriched my life and they've enriched my walk with God uh, and I hope that, and they know that I'd love them to become Christians. Um, they know that, um, that, and I know that they'd like me to become their faiths, um, but uh, I'm praying for God to do work in their lives and in mine as he brings those who he will call to himself over time. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Tim, for being on Awkward. It has been a pleasure hearing your views and your stories of what God is doing um, throughout the country through the feast. So if you want to find out more about the feast charity, log on um, to their official website, which is thefeast.org.uk, or you can follow them on Twitter at The Feast Project, or search for The Feast as well on Facebook. So thank you very much, Tim. Um, thank you very much for coming away from Birmingham. Really appreciate it. Um, in the meantime, have a good journey, and um, I'll speak to you soon. Thank you, and good night. Good night. Awkward, honest answers to awkward questions. With Lucy Marskell, sponsored by Urban Saints. Yep, we're right at the end of the show now of Awkward. It has been a really good episode. I had Tim Fawcett talk about interfaith dialogue with Muslim and Christian young people. And I learned a lot. I don't know about you, but it really challenged me of how um, I chat and how I treat um, people of other faiths, whether Muslim, they're Sikh, they're Hindu, they're Jedi, whatever they believe, you know? I think it's a really important lesson for all of us that no matter what you believe about Muhammad, the Quran, Jesus, what you believe about other religions, it is important, as Tim said, to lovingly um, dialogue with people and to even pray for them, you know? Jesus says to us that we should pray um, for everybody, you know, no, regardless of how they treat us or what we think of them. That is a standard, and um, the standard is to love God and to love your neighbor. So it's challenging for us all. Anyway, I thought I'd leave you um, with a Bible verse as well as um, what's coming up in tomorrow, tomorrow's show? Next week's show. I wish it was tomorrow, but next week's show. So Jesus says um, to Thomas in John 14, he says, um, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and you have seen him. So no matter where you're listening today, whether you're Christian, Muslim or other, um, know that Jesus is God and that he really, really um, is alive.